So truly good restaurants have one secret that kind of bumps up their food and makes it better than just about everything I make at home. It starts at the source, the stock, which we can turn into demi-glaze or demi-glace. It's a pretty chill day today. Welcome back to Bourdain. Everybody should know how to use a knife. Use everything, waste nothing. Let's start at the beginning. It ain't that hard, okay? My name is Mitch May. I'm learning how to cook everything in here for the first time. I make some mistakes. The last episode, I made quite a big one, but today is a little more chill and honestly, I kind of need it. We're gonna make a stock today. And more importantly, with good stock comes demi glace. It's this super rich French brown sauce. It is like the mother for all things amazing in French cuisine, at least a lot of it anyway. Many of the dishes in here call for demi glace and I haven't been able to provide that magical ingredient. Now Bourdain says here, classically demi-glace was a reduction of equal parts, reduced veal stock and sauce espagnole. We ain't gonna do that today. We're gonna go with Bourdain's and I quote, rough, crude, far from classic and perfectly workable in most restaurant situations. Now I'm gonna do a variation here. I am not going to use veal. I'm gonna use beef bones, just an older version of veal. I'm not too crazy about the ethics of veal and I know there is humanely raised veal. I'm yet to find humanely raised veal. Break it down with what we need. Liberal with the portions here because Bourdain just goes after percentages bones. I got equal parts, leg bones and knuckles. The knuckles are pretty key. Veal bones are preferred due to their high levels of collagen. Beef bones don't have as much collagen as veal bones, but knuckles, they all have high levels of collagen. Bump up the collagen and that'll create more of a body to this stock. A little tomato paste is required. 50% white onion, 25% carrot and 25% celery. It totals no more than a third the volume of bones. We'll also need some bay leaf and thyme and purified water. And as far as specialized equipment, a big ass pot because this stock is going to reduce pretty heavily. I got Bourdain's book linked down below in the description and let's just hang out with Mr. Bourdain for the day. All right, so we're going for more of a babish style video today. Five pounds of regular beef bones and five pounds of knuckles. First things first, rinse all of these off in cold water. My hands were getting numb, I'm not gonna lie. Time for the knuckles as well. I noticed there's a decent amount of connective tissue, whatever tissue, funky tissue on these things. I just rinsed them off, figured it's good for the flavors. We then get these over to dry because we're going to coat them with the tomato sauce and we want them to roast in the pan as well. Water is not Browning's friend. Into a big ass bowl with our tomato paste and we just go to town mixing them. My dad decides to make a peanut butter and jelly while I am mixing beef bones for a stock. Everything into a pan and we roast this now at 350 degrees. Some people go higher. Bourdain says 350. And note, I did not use any flour. I just felt like it could be excessive. Halfway through our cook time, I give them a nice flip to make sure we get even browning. Most importantly, no scorching of these bones I paid decent money for. It's time to get our vegetables ready. There is no direct measurement. It is all relative to the amount of bones you have. Again, I'll repeat from Anthony Bourdain, 25% carrots, 25% celery, 50% onion, and all of that combined should be no more than one third of the beef bones. Here's a visual of the ratio of vegetables I have. From here, it kind of looks like equal parts onion, carrot, celery. I think it'll be fine. Just don't want a lot compared to the bones. After about 45 minutes, I noticed a nice color on the bones and they go in our massive pot, the mess pot. Everything in, I think this was from my grandfather when he opened a restaurant and I noticed there's some serious funk on the pan, but I think it's blood, so I'm not adding it to the stock. Vegetables, welcome to the party. No, I do add the onion peels. I heard they have a lot of flavor and we go in with the water. Purified to be exact. A little extra just to top this off. I know this is going to be reducing for quite some time and I bring it up to high and we add our herbs, rosemary, bay leaves, who knows if they do sh but I added them. Give it a quick stir and let this come up to a gentle simmer. Bourdain makes it certain to not actually boil your stock. After about an hour or two, I noticed some funk, some foam coming to the top. After that, all that was left was really fat. So I let this thing simmer overnight and here we are in the morning with some Wheaties. An absolute dramatic change in color and smell. It went from like barnyard to absolutely bistro. That sounds kind of cool. But here we are with the stock reduced to almost half and I got to go to physical therapy in Philly. So I top it off and come back to it in a few hours. I figure bring you along with me. I record with my phone anyway. This is the train I take into the city. Funnest part is picking out a seat that isn't dirty or laid on by someone. I figure I stay on theme here with Kitchen Confidential. I'm still trying to finish it up and now's the perfect time. Funny part in the book is Bourdain actually talks about food runners and other staff workers minus waiters which I think was intentional but I was a food runner for a large majority of my restaurant career and it's funny to see his take on them 
here we are, lovely Philadelphia. Always puts a spring in my step, especially when I would have to go to work this way. But it's a cool spot, a lot of restaurants. It's like a diet New York City in a good way. And I end up getting back home after PT. And I then come back to just a marvelously darkly colored stock. It's time to get everything out of this thing. The bones, the big parts of vegetables. As you can see, I'm putting it all on the line with this little yellow dinky strainer. It's starting to bend and warp, but it does hold up. I think you would just find this fascinating how weird this stuff looks after it comes out of the pot. But I strain it through a sieve and I go for two or three other strains. As Bourdain says, I quote, as many as you can stand. Yeah, that's risky what I'm doing, but that's the way I live, I live on the edge. I noticed the sieve caught some serious chunks. So I put that back into the yellow strainer and again, I just sieve this out three or four times. And I would say the sieve is pretty key here or some cheesecloth because it does catch that fine bloody material, I guess. You can see here just how velvety this stock is. This is what people refer to when they say body. See how it doesn't look like water? It's got almost this viscosity to it. And I'm just like salivating, staring at this thing. Tasted pretty damn good at this point. But now it's time to bring this stock temperature down because bacteria is not magical. So in an ice bath, stir it up until it gets down to no steam and it's pretty cool to the touch. Transfer it to the fridge for a few hours so the fat can solidify. The fat just comes right off and I strain the excess little globs through the sieve. And from here we have our magnificent beef stock. It is now time to turn this into demi glass. Per Bourdain, this is not official demi that we are creating, but this is perfectly serviceable. Half a bottle of wine, reduce it by half and add three to four shallots cut in half. And it's time to just reduce just like the stock, slow, steady, not boiling. And I noticed there's almost this candy like substance around the edge of the pot. Can't lose that. I refuse to lose that. So I scrape away, it gets reduced further, it thickens up. This process took about three to four hours and it's time to strain this magical sauce. Again, Bourdain says do this as many times as you can stand. And here we have the just luxurious, thick, rich sauce. Not candy sticky, but I noticed when it dries, it gets really uniquely sticky. And here's just a test to show you how viscous this is. Swipe a finger through there, it doesn't move. This even got Momo's attention, which is saying something. The flavor of this, I have never had before. It was a legendary deepness, savory flavor that I can't explain. You just have to try it for yourself. I get some Demi on the cookbook and I feel like there's almost a poetic thing going on here, getting a little <laughs> of your finished sauce on the recipe that calls for the sauce into little cubes. Julia Child and Bourdain agrees this is a very useful way to store the Demi glass. You can use it to thicken up sauces, add body, add flavor. And whenever you need a little flavor boost, you just pop an ice cube in there or half of an ice cube and into the fridge overnight. Here we are the next morning. It has been a three day process. I'm ready, I'm hyped, and it's all over my table. It is stuck on my table like glue. The cubes come out and what a unique thing this is. They're almost gelatinous, but they're clearly solidified. They almost remind me of like a rubber dye, if that makes sense, the way they bounce. And here I have a little extra demi I stored in the fridge. This has solidified as well. And it is just like a jello flavor cube. I don't know, got no other words for it. Here we are, our demi glass. We are locked and loaded, ready to flavor enhance, ready to really do the recipes as Bourdain has instructed. It was a process, it came out well. It was deeply gratifying to create this. As Bourdain says, a monkey could do it. So naturally I struggled a little bit. And if you'd like, you know, come along for the ride, subscribe, more videos to come where I use our now secret weapon. Stay organized and clean up after yourself. You do the best you can.